Father, I thank you for thy goodness, faithfulness, and love towards me this night. My love to all sinners that when we were yet sinful, you died for us. Let we might live. Father, I ask that you would stand before me, and Satan, you get thee behind me in Jesus' name. I pray that your word would go forth, and your word as you please, and for your glory. Just hide me now on the cross, and bless us all. Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. First, I want to say thank you to you, Pastor, for giving me the privilege to stand and share about um, what we're doing in China and to share from the Word here, first of all, for the next about eight minutes share from God's word. I know, I know how difficult that might be to give someone a place in a pulpit, but this is, this is probably the most holy place on earth, I would imagine. Even higher than the president's seat, someone to stand here and preach to God's people is it's a very serious and sobering thing on my behalf, so I, I don't hold it lightly. Um, the message I'm going to share today has come from about three to four years of God just doing share anything else but what God has done to me first. So thank you, Pastor, and thank you for giving me your attentive ears. My passage for today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's just a short passage situated there in the second epistle of Timothy chapter 2. Only one verse, verse 3, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Again, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I know we all have. In our own life, trials, tribulations, hard things to endure, but indeed soldiers fight through it because of not our strength, but because of Jesus Christ. And so I don't believe the church was created through the blood of Jesus and his body to peace and comfort and ease in this life. I don't believe it. God created his church for war, for combat, to march forward, and to do work for Jesus. Thou therefore endure hardness, endure hardness, endure trial, tribulation, hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So that's my main passage today, and now I'm going to speak to you today, I want to speak on the worthiness of Christ for our full surrender. The worthiness of Christ for your full surrender. If you would just flip over a few uh, books to Revelation. Let me touch on a few here as we get started. We'll start in Revelations chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I would like to say this passage is a good one to start in prayer in your own life. Start here in prayer. Revelation chapter 1, in verse 13. Remember, John was exiled as a good soldier, exiled on the Isle of Patmos as a good soldier, cast out of the congregation of men but joined in the fellowship of Jesus Christ as a good soldier. And he says this, In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, 
and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in the strain. When I saw him, John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, as one that worshiped the Lord. Turn over now to Revelation 4. We're looking at the worthiness of Christ first, the worth of Christ Jesus. Here is the worth of Christ Jesus now in chapter uh, 4 of Revelation, starting in verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 9, Revelation 5, verse 9. They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I don't know, i finish the reading of scripture here in Revelation, I don't know if I have begun to estimate the worthiness of Christ. I don't know. Have you, have we begun to estimate the worthiness of Christ and begin to fill our minds and hearts with his worthiness. I believe the one man who's an American pastor in prison today in Turkey, he might have begun to estimate his worthiness. He's now been in prison in Turkey for two years. He just faced court trial. They ordered him back to prison. He was serving the church there. Had given many years there. Was going to give his life there. Renounced citizenship in America. And in prison, he writes a song saying, Thou art worthy. Lord, thou art worthy. Worthy art thou for my all to give to thee. And he sings to Jesus. His name's Andrew Brunson. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe he has begun to estimate the worth of Christ in his tribulation, in his suffering, in his persecution. I don't know why. Could I do that then? Could you do that there in prison? Oh, it is said of Jesus. Let me go through a few scriptures now of Jesus and his word. It is said of Jesus he loved and does love righteousness. And he hates, he hated and he does hate lawlessness. It was said of him while he was on earth, the son of man hath nowhere to lay his head. It is said of his, he did always those things that pleased the Father. And when he prayed, oh, when he prayed on earth, the Bible says he was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things that he suffered. It is said when he was smitten of others, when he was beaten, he opened not his mouth. This Lord and Christ was crucified, has now been enthroned on high, as we read in Revelation. He is there on a throne.
having got there through a bloody cross. He is worthy, worthy for our full surrender. He had no comeliness or beauty to attract us to him. He had nowhere to lay his head, no house, no car. These things. He went about with truth and grace, doing good and healing the sick, fulfilling the law and all righteousness was spotless and without sin. Being delivered then by the determinate counsel of God, was taken by wicked hands and slain, crucified outside the city on a cursed tree, becoming a curse for us. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He was wrapped in borrowed clothes. He was perfumed with someone else's perfume and died on a cursed tree. This Jesus, crucified for our sins, this Jesus, this Son, this man, God-man, God hath raised up and exalted him. Where is he now? Where is he now? He's seated on a throne at the right hand of God. How long will he be there? Until his enemies are made his footstool, says God. And forever and ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. What is he doing there? What is Christ doing there right now? He's making intercession for us, for his church. That we would endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And he has two desires. I believe he has two desires as I've read the scripture. Two desires in Jesus' heart. Number one, quickly, he wishes to destroy the unrighteousness and the unrighteous world. He wishes to destroy this wicked world. We see that in Luke chapter 12, verse 49. We can write it down. Luke chapter 12, verse 49. But he's slow to anger, isn't he? And he desires today none to perish and go to hell. He desires none to perish, and yet he also desires to destroy this wicked world with fire. This is of the worthiness of Christ. And lastly, it is said of Jesus. When he, after, was baptized in water, what did it say when he came out of the water? Remember? The Holy Ghost descended upon him. And it says in Matthew, or Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Where? Where? Into the wilderness. We've got to catch that. Into hardness. Into a difficult place. For 40 days. He was there tempted of the devil. He was there fasting. For 40 days. He was there tested. In a difficult place. And after 40 days. He was found worthy. And he came out of the wilderness having replenished himself in God his Father, in power, in power. He was found a man on earth, unconquerable, nothing could defeat him. He was found a man victorious by God himself, and a man filled with heavenly fire. He had no attachment to this world. In fact, he says, the devil cometh and hath, hath nothing in me. Hallelujah. So the worthiness of Christ, I, I hope you can now begin to estimate as we think of the worthiness of Christ by these passages of the worthiness of Christ who went through hardness, showing the example that we are to follow. What does surrender mean? Surrender, there's three facets of the meaning of the word surrender. I'd like to touch on that quickly. Number one, it's an act of giving up possessions and person into the authority of another. 
It is an act of giving up possessions and your person, your body, into the authority of another. Number two, it's to give back that which is given to you. If we can think of an earthly example, think of soldiers taking a, a small territory, holding it for a time, and then their enemy comes and takes it back and wins. They have to, that one key, uh, army has to surrender, right? And so they have to yield back the territory they just took to a stronger army. So it's to give back that which is given to you. And then thirdly, it's to take all commands and directions from the new commander, the new authority. When an army soldier, for instance, joins the army, he has to sign his name on a contract. What is he saying in that contract? He's saying, I will give my life for this army, for their mission that they send me. No matter what, he's laying his life down, saying, you can use my life, whether I live or die, to do what you want with me. And so when we look at these three means, these three facets of surrender, we can apply spiritual uh, definition to it. It's an act of giving up. When we surrender, absolutely, we surrender. We give up our possessions and person into the authority of Christ. Number two, we give back that which, that which was given to us. Christ gave his body to us. He gave his blood for us. And so we are to do the same. We are to give ourselves back to him, no matter what he calls us to. And then number three, we're to take all commands from that point on, from Jesus Christ. He is our commander. He can guide us. He can lead us. And when we follow him, we will not go astray. This is total resignation, absolute surrender. Maybe you're familiar with Andrew Murray's work, wonderful work on absolute surrender. He describes absolute surrender to God as the one thing vital in the Christian life. And he says it is the condition for obtaining God's full blessing in our life. Absolute surrender. <coughs> and so, what about us? If we would be as our Lord Jesus Christ, we must live as our Lord Jesus Christ. And we must be willing to die as our Lord Jesus Christ. In essence, when someone absolutely surrenders and yields his life to Christ, he is saying to the Lord, Lord, for thy blood, take my life, no matter what. He's saying, my life for the world, for the world needs Christ. One of the most sobering things I've thought of, one of the most sobering thoughts I've thought of is, is this scripture. He that will live sovereign in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. The world can only put up with Jesus for three plus years, but they put up with me for a long time. Is, my, is Christ in me provoking the world? Is it in you? Is your want and desire for godliness in Christ in you provoking your neighbors? And I must say, when we look at an aspect of what Christ is calling his church to, we would have to say, Lord, we have failed. We have not done our duty. For the Lord is worthy. Christ is worthy of our full surrender in prayer. That's why. Number one, in prayer. What kind of prayer? The kind of prayer that time doesn't matter. That kind of prayer. And so maybe my prayer life, maybe your prayer life is agreed to God today. Maybe. This is convicting your heart. Maybe you should say, Lord, is it I? Am I guilty of you? Corey Ten Boom called prayerlessness a sin. Are you prayerless today? Am I prayerless? God is calling us to prayer, a life of prayer, to pray without ceasing. 
a burden to win souls, a burden in prayer to pray for souls, and then a seal to come out of prayer to win souls. If we could, if we could put our ear to heaven, and listen to our Savior pray today. Our lives would never be the same. Our prayer lives would never be the same. Do you dare to put your ear to heaven? Say, oh Lord, let me hear you pray just a minute, just a second, just a moment. We, our prayer lives would change. For we would hear our Savior groan in prayer. Intercede with his whole being. Take us, Lord, to the river for cleansing. Lord, to the river of thy precious blood. Take us to the throne room where you pray, Lord, and give us the groan and intercession to win this generation. Take us through Gethsemane, the place of strengthening, the baptism, power, and surrender that we might be victorious with Christ. I wonder... Do you know why the house of God is called, or is to be, a house of prayer? Do you know why? It's because the Bible says heaven is his throne, and earth his footstool. And on one hand, the church bows at the Lord Jesus' feet in worship, in prayer, in service. And on the other side, the Lord's feet will trample the wicked at the end of this, at the end of time. Because Daryl Champlin, a missionary, who, a third generation missionary, said this of groaning in prayer. He said, we will be judged, church. We will be judged how we groan in prayer. Are you groaning? Leonard Ravenhill went to Dr. Tozer's house one day. And Dr. Tozer, you can all know the name, Dr. Tozer led him into the study. And he pointed to the, a rug on the floor and said, Brother Len, I often come to this study. And I get down on my belly on that rug from 8 in the morning till 12 in the afternoon. And I worship. Tozer said, I worship. I don't say a word of prayer. I don't say a word of praise. I just worship in silence. Did you catch what we read in Revelations chapter 4? They in heaven unceasingly, day and night unceasingly, say holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Can we find an hour in our day? 30 minutes, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes, can we find time to worship our Lord? And are we busy worshiping? Spurgeon never took credit for his preaching. Do you know what he pointed to? He pointed to the basement. He called it the furnace room, the boiler room. And he said, there, that's that's where my power in preaching comes from, not from me, there. And so I feel, I believe, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit for us today is nothing less than the heart beating, desire, panting, groaning, burden, intercession of God in our hearts. Burning hotter and hotter and hotter, bearing fruit unto life eternal for the worth and the glory of King Jesus. Spurgeon said prayer is the throbbing machinery of the church. It's where we get our power and, and preaching from. The place of kindling the fire in your life fire of God is the place of prayer. It's the place of preparation. There's two, it's, the, it's the position of a soldier. The soldier, there's two positions for a soldier of Christ. 
One's on his knees, or his belly, and the other's on his feet, going forth to share the glorious gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. No prayer, my friends, no prayer, no power. It's as simple as that. No, no enduring hardness as a good soldier. You're not even a good soldier if you're not praying. Prayer is for the obtaining the power. My friends, in a personal testimony, I never had confidence with God in my life until I said all to the Lord I looked at my house and my substance and said, God, just take it all if you want. Take me, use me, whatever you want. That's what it took. And I felt that prayer went straight up into heaven. And then he sent me to China. He'll do it. He'll send you somewhere. Maybe just downtown or maybe to your neighbor. But he'll send you somewhere. If you'll just say, Lord, everything you can have, I commit it into your hands. That's absolute surrender. And I would dare say that if this fire of surrender goes out or is not ignited in you or me, then our neighbor's doomed. Our neighborhood is doomed. Our city is doomed. Our nation is doomed. In fact, the nation is in the condition it's in, not just America, but China and all, all around, because we've forgotten the power in prayer, and that in prayer we find all of God's ability. So God, Christ is worthy for our full surrender in prayer. And secondly, Christ is worthy of our full surrender in service, in prayer and in service. Service is simply putting on the boots of a soldier, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's putting on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword, which is the word of God. And then it says, and pray without ceasing. We are soldiers. Have we seen what we can do in prayer? And then go take in service when we pray with all our heart. God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. And he commends, he approves his living sacrifices, you and me, by fire of service. With the fire of his presence. I wonder, when did we last see a priest, as the Revelation says that we are, when did we last see a priest on this earth who could stand between God and the sinful world and command them to repent and to bring the good news? We are priests to stand between God of heaven and the lost of this earth with the fire of service, the fire of surrender, that we might say, God, let me be as you are in this world. Just as we should put our ear to heaven, we should put our ear to the ground of this world. We should put our ear, you know how they used to put their ear to the ground and they could hear horses coming from a mile ways away? We should do the same. And we would hear the eternal march of an eternal soul depending to eternity. Desire to win souls for Christ, to go to our knees in prayer and to rise victorious in Christ. That's the way of a soldier of Jesus Christ. Let me finish, the next three minutes, let me finish with a story of a man named C.T. Stubb. I don't have time to share all that I want to, but he came to surrender his life to Christ and he served in three different continents. He served in three different continents. The last one was the dead darkness of Africa. In 1910, he went to Africa. This was his fourth surrender in his life, his fourth giving all to Christ in terms of him going forward for Christ. He went penniless. He went without doctor's approval. 
The doctors denied him. He said, your body's too weak. It won't last. You won't do anything for God then. He went dropped by a committee of support who previously had promised full support financially. They dropped him. He went without his wife and four daughters. And he sailed for the heart of Africa until 1931. From 1910 to 1931, he healed it all. Do you know what he said to the committee before he left? He said, gentlemen, God has called me to go. And I will go. I will blaze the trail. Though my grave may only become a stepping stone that other younger men may follow. That's indeed what the life of surrender does. It blazes the trail for others to follow. Who blazed our trail? Who planted our way? It's Christ Jesus the Lord with his own blood that we too might say, yes, Lord, I will follow in your footsteps. I will lay my life down, even if it requires my blood. And then, as I finish here, C.T. Stubb looked back on his life, he examined his life, and he said, I have found nothing else that I can surrender and sacrifice to my Lord Jesus Christ. How will we finish our race? Will we look back at the, all the things we should or could have sacrificed and surrendered to the end of the Lord? Will we walk with the full blessing of Christ and God in our lives? C.T. Studs said, I can't find anything else. He died happy. He died happy in the dead of his life, having borne much fruit for Christ as a good soldier, enduring hardness. Enduring hardness. And now as we go to communion, let me just say just a quick word about communion. Christ gave his body and blood, yes? And as we take the bread that symbolizes his body, as we drink the blood that symbol, or the wine that symbolizes his blood, we are saying to the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, I will endure hardness as a good soldier of you. You've given your body to me, I will give my body to the world. You gave your blood to me, I will give my blood to you, Jesus. That's that's unity with the Lord. That's walking with Him in the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord, now for this prayer. May you bless it to the hearing and edification of all our sins, Lord. And this time, Lord, grab on my Lay it down now at your feet. Jesus.
sometimes after our services, we have our prayer times. If the devil can stop you from praying privately and corporately, he can stop us. So, good message. Okay, we're going to prepare for a community. So it's just been four hours on his face, and I knew he prayed on his face. Somewhere a year ago, there was either a picture, I think, of something of him on the beach there on Lake Michigan, in the sand, on a rug, praying. Praying. God really has used him as a general. And our, our good story is good points, good work.